Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just start the recording right quick. All right. So what I'd like to do today is something a little bit different, not a um, little bit of an experiment as well for the uh, graduate class that I'm going to start uh, teaching in a week. That doesn't sound right, uh, but never mind. So um, I'd like to go through the way we build a model starting from pretty much it's blank canvas of a page. So starting from nothing. And it's not something that we usually uh, teach a lot. It's, it's not necessarily something that it's part of the um, mathematical modeling education in biology, uh, as opposed to, you know, just learning the uh, classical model that everyone knows and, and loves and Lotka Volterra, um, Beverton Holt, whatever. Um, but in practice, when you're doing modeling as part of your scientific research, uh, it's, it, it's not unusual to start with, it's pretty much nothing in terms of an actual model, but you start with some general intuitions about the way biology works. And, and you, can, you can go surprisingly far with these intuitions and you can turn them into equation um, as, as part of the uh, process of coming up with the actual model. So that's what I'd like to do today. The difference is that this time we know what the answer is. We know we know the correct model and we know family of correct model, but the important thing is that we can go step by step through a process that is going to lead us from intuitions to um, some, some sort of equation that we're going to be able to manipulate. So the thing that we'd like to uh, write a model for is a, uh, an infectious disease. And we're going to assume the simplest possible situation in which um, you're an individual and you are infectious at some point. So we're going to call that I and it's your stat. Uh, your status as an individual. And that's where we start thinking about, okay, what happens to this individual from a biological point of view? Well, after some time, and we don't need to specify what this time is. We just, after some time, this individual is going to start being infectious. And we're going to say, well, it, it's not going to develop any sort of long lasting immunity. So it's going to um, get back to being susceptible. And that is the first process that we put into our model. You are infectious because you got the disease in some way. So we're going to think about what that can be uh, much later on. And after some time, you start being infectious um, and begin to start naming things. So this interval here, the time during which you um, remain infectious, we're going to call that T um, R. So that the time, it, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive because it's a time during which you remain infectious, but it's actually how long it takes you to recover from your infectious status up until the point where you're not infectious. So that's the time to recover it. That's process number one, um, and we're done. We're going to put that in a box and say, okay, I've, I've thought about the biology of this system really, really hard, and that is the best I can come up with. You start, you're infectious, and after some point, you're not infectious anymore. Well, let's, let's, um, let's add a, a second process to this model. We are going to start with the same individual, and it is also infectious. Right, uh, it's going to be field, whatever. Okay, um, and over time, over a possible very long amount of time, so we don't need to specify quite yet, this individual is going to run into individuals that are susceptible, and it's going to turn them into individuals that become infectious. So it's going to create one, two, three new cases, right? And we can, we're going to make a little bit of a simplification here because we, we don't want to deal with too much complexity at this point. And say, so, well, this time here, the time for the moment you become infectious up until your first um, instance where you, you convert an individual that is susceptible into an individual that is infectious, we're going to call that TI. It's a time between two infection events. And then you run into someone and, and this is jump from you to this person and become infectious themselves. But you also um, keep on being infectious for another amount of time here. And you continue this process and we are going to assume 
that over time there's going to be an infection event every so often and this interval on average is going to be um, a length of time called ti so uh, it's a second process and it's not really a process let's let's be honest it's just a description of what happens we don't really think about um, what is the what are the mechanisms what is the um, the, the rate of contact, the probability that two individuals are going to run into one another, what is the rate of contagion of the disease when there is a contact, it's just that every so often, at a set interval in time, you're going to be responsible for a new infection event. But that's, surprisingly, um, something that will let us develop intuition that can lead us um, really far, surprisingly far, actually. So, let's... Um, let, let's play around a little bit with these two times, right? We have the, the time to recovery and the time of infection. So we're going to say um, there is an individual here that is infectious and it is going to remain so for um, a time that is called TR. And then we're going to think about three different um, infectious diseases for this one individual. The first one here you are infectious and it's going to take some time ti to create your new um, infection so here we have ti that is larger than tr the situation first situation um, so that's the candidate disease number one number two you start infectious and then it's going to take you the exact same amount of time to create a new infectious individual than it takes you to recover. And this is number three. It's going to take you a shorter amount of time up until you recover here to create a new infectious individual. So we have three situations, right? We have one where um, it, it takes you longer to infect someone than it takes you to recover, one it takes you the same amount of time, and one where it's going to um, take you a shorter amount of time to infect someone than it takes you to recover. So one thing that we can, we can start thinking about is how many, uh, how many new infectious individuals are you expected to create when you start being infectious? based on the, the two rules that we uh, we came up with in our model. So here, for disease number one, um, um, there's going to be the TR is, is, in, is lower than TI, and so you're going to create, on average, zero point something individual, right? So the number of new cases, uh, the number of new cases is going to be zero point something which is lower than one um, here you're going to create a new individual that is infectious at exactly the same moment where you are um, you, you recover so it's going to be exactly equal to one this one not really realistic it's in nature things never are truly equal but it's interesting to just consider it for a moment uh, this one here you're going to create one, two, three, you're going to create a number of new cases that is larger than, uh, than one. So whenever you have a model of population change and the growth rate of this model is lower than one, you expect this population to shrink. When it's larger than one, you expect this population to expand over time. And so we can say, well, if it takes longer for you to infect someone than it takes to recover, then we can expect that the disease is not going to propagate through the population. Um, on the other end, if you have the opportunity to infect multiple people before you recover from the disease, then what we expect is actually that the disease is going to spread. And how much new cases you should be expecting to um, create this way is something that we can, uh, we can measure by taking uh, TR and dividing it by, uh, dividing it by um, by ti so we uh we can express this as so a number of new cases uh new 
Okay, this is it's tr divided by ti. It's not necessarily, you know, it, it's thing that we can measure, but it, it's not, that doesn't really get us closer to a model. That um, is some, some important intuition here. Let, let's put a pin in that because we're going to get back to this when we've um, written the actual model, but um, it, it's something that should um, inform the way we're going to be thinking about uh, the model. So that's a first draft of the model. And the work is actually, it's almost done here. Um, there's a few little things that we need to put together to come up with an actual uh, model, but the conceptual work of things, there's two processes, one is recovery, one is infection. Um, it's, it's going to be framing a lot of decision that uh, we're going to take to come up with our model. So let's, um, let's think about what is the simplest process that we can write as a series of equations here. And probably the simplest process that we can write is actually how we go from being infectious, I, to not being infectious anymore, S. And we have decided that it takes something that we call TR, amount of time, to go from I to S. So let, let's try to scale this up because we are interested in more than a single individual, right? And so if we, if we look at the, um, the uh, time series of different infection for different people, it's going to, you know, it's going to catch the disease at different times. And there's probably going to be a little bit of variation in how long they actually remain infectious here. So we're going to have one value of TR here, a different value of TR for this individual, a different value, so on and so forth. And what that means is we actually should expect to have something that looks like a distribution of these values. And I don't like that because whenever you start having a distribution, it, it means that you need to think about your problem in terms of what is the probability of these values, what is the probability of obtaining this value. It's, it's, a, it's complicated. It's not impossible to do, um, definitely not, but it's a lot more complicated for a first, um, a first attempt at coming up with a model. So we're going to make another simplification that says, well, sorry about that. On average, the time that you spend to recover is whatever this value here. So we're going to call that TR uh, bar. That is the average amount of time that it takes to, um, to recover for any random individual picked in the population. It's a simplification because if you happen to be this individual, it's going to be very wrong for you. If you happen to be this individual, it's going to be very wrong for you. But we're sort of assuming that the world is well behaved. It has a normal distribution. Um, that not to spread around the average. And so we're going to be wrong, but on average, we're going to be right. Um, and it doesn't really matter um, anyway, because we're just interested in um, developing insights, building up intuition with this model. So we're going to say, well, that's good enough. So next question, the very important question that we, um, we need to address is, uh, what are the units of TR here? So the units of TR, it's going to be whatever. We're going to say days, but it's going to be a certain amount of time that you spend in this compartment, right? Um, and the reason I'm thinking about units at this point in the process is because units have rules of arithmetics. Um, and one of the interesting rules of units that if you have a model that say, something is equal to something else, so units on either side, they must be the same. If you have a model that say one quantity plus another quantity, then the units on these two sides of the plus sign, they must be the same. Um, and, and so if you start thinking about, okay, I have a simple process, I'm going to put that into my model, and you start thinking about what are the units, then it's going to help you make some decisions about the, um, uh, the way to express other parts of the problem. Uh, we tend not to think about units quite enough, but they're very important. So we've expressed something in, in, in days. So it's an interval um, of time 
which means that presumably, you know, we'd be interested in something that is um, the value of i over time. And that's usually not what we know. We don't, we, we can't, in this case, we can. Um, and it's, it's not that complicated, but it's complicated enough that if I were to try and do it live, I would, I would fail. The solution is in textbook, but we don't have an explicit solution uh, for, for this value, for the model that we're going to build. We, there is one, we can find it. It's a little bit, the bright amount of painful for a graduate class, for example, but um, what we can come up with is the mechanisms for change. So we can think about what is making this value change over time. So instead of expressing the value itself, we're expressing the change um, in this value. In this case, we're going to um, express that as a um, differential equation. So there's a little mathematical trick that's very useful is that when you have something that is a time and you do one over this quantity, it's going to magically turn into a rate of change. So we know that on average, um, any infectious individual is going to spend um, TR at, uh, TR bar, sorry, days in uh, its infectious state. And so the rate of uh, recovery is going to be one over TR bar. Uh, we're going to call that gamma because that's what it's been called historically. And that is something that we're going to put into our model. So one thing that's important here, and that's important to keep in mind, is that we know that TR as a distribution, we're taking the average and we're doing one over the average, um, this is a thing that we can measure. We, we, we don't go necessarily and measure gamma in nature, uh, but we can measure this. And, and maybe depending on the shape of the distribution, that is an assumption that is uh, safe to make or not. But for the moment, we're going to say, well, it's, you know, it's safe enough. So what does it mean to be um, a rate of change? It, it means essentially that if there is a um, short amount of time here, the amount of, uh, of, of change that we expect for each individual is going to be, uh, it's going to be gamma. And gamma is a rate uh, that is expressed at the individual level. So the total change that we expect to see is the rate gamma applied to all of the individuals that are in the infectious state in this population. So essentially what that means is um, we have two, That is not a nice circle. Uh, we have two groups. And I'm just drawing them this way because we're going to turn that into a biostats 101 problem in a minute. Um, and and the, the rate of change, so the flow of individual from this group to this group happens at a rate that we have called gamma. So we have I individual here and S individual here. Another way to say that is, well, the, um, this S group is going to gain gamma times I individual and this I group is going to lose gamma times I individuals. So what we've done here is that we have created two compartments and we started describing the change of um, of population size between these two compartments. And if you've, if you've done even a little bit of, of modeling, you know that it's what, what we started doing here is writing a series of differential equation for this model that say, well, over a very short amount of time, so d over dt, the very, uh, variation of a very small amount of time of s is going to be gamma times i and similarly, the variation of a very short amount of time of i is going to be minus gamma times i. This is a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a pain to write. So we're going to simplify this. And instead of using d over dt of s, we're going to be using s dot equals gamma i and i dot equal minus gamma i. Just a little notation uh, saying that we can use in order to make it less um, 
less um, cumbersome to write. So all that we've done so far uh, is, okay, we, we have a rule that we made up in our head that says you remain infectious for a period of time that is called TR. That has a distribution of values, presumably, but never mind, we're just going to take the average. That ends up being a duration. Um, duration is not something that we want to work with. We'd like to have a rate, and so we invert the duration that gives us a rate. And then we, re we remember, oh, that's actually the rate of change, and so that's a differential equation, and that's cool. But let's let's check a couple things because there's a lot of there's a lot to unpack here. Surprisingly, for a model that only has one um, one mechanism in it, so um, we know that the units of gamma, it's uh, the units of T R bar minus one, right? Because when you take a value um, and you apply an operation to it, you apply the same operation to its unit, which is, it's nice. And so the units of gamma here is going to be days minus one. So what is the units of, for example, the uh, change of the susceptible individuals over time? Well, it's going to be the units of gamma times the units of i, right? And so then again, we're multiplying these two um, operations. Uh, so let's, uh, let's reorganize that. It's going to be the units of i times the units of gamma. And it is going to be uh, individual times day minus one. I'm using the square brackets to say um, units that not standard notation, but just for the duration of this tutorial, that's what I'm going to be using. Um, and then we have our, um, we have an important information here, which is that we are describing the change in population uh, that is expressed in individual per day. So uh, if we expressed uh, TR in units of days, and we counting the population in number of individuals, then the, the rate of change is expressed as individual per days. We can check the same thing here. Uh, the, the units of uh, I dot, it's minus, um, and minus the units mean just like the units. If you have two centimeters or minus two centimeters, it's still, two, still expressed in units of centimeters. So it's going to be the units of gamma times the units of i, and we can check that it is also because the same thing, individual over days. So what is really important here is that the compartment in the model, um, they have the same units, and we can check that we're actually describing a rate of change here, it's individual per day, uh, as a process of something that is expressed as per day, uh, a rate, and number of individuals. So that's really nice. This model has a second interesting property here uh, before we go into building something more complex and it is um, it is expressed as follow. What if we do, what is the change in S plus the change in I? And that's important because you know S and I are numbers of individuals. And so the change in S is going to be how many individuals are gained or lost by the S compartment and the same thing for I. And so if we do the, the, the sum of changes for S and the sum of changes for I, we're going to see the change in the total population size. Right, and so S plus I is equal to gamma times I minus gamma times I, and that is equal to zero. That's nice. Um, and that's nice for a very uh, important reason, which is that at any time, because there is no change in the population so far, uh, the number of individual uh, that are susceptible plus the number of individual that are infectious is going to be equal to some constant that we call n, just because it's population size, and it's going to be equal to s0 plus i0. How many individuals you had at the beginning of your, um, if you, the brand of your model, it's going to be the same amount of individual over time. There is no change in the population size, 
we can have this type of models with changes in population size. We can have demographics without changes in population size. We can complexify things arbitrarily as much as we can, but for the moment, we've, we've um, checked something that is very important, that when an individual is infectious, he returns to being susceptible that does not change the number of individuals in the overall population. So it's, it's not just something that is a, a mathematical property of the model, it's just a validation that we've expressed the rules that we set up here in a way that is actually uh, making uh, demographic sense. There is no change in the um, number of individuals that, um, that we have. So uh, let, let's get back for a minute to um, this, the master plan that we have. Um, this is done. It's done and we've expressed it as being uh, the rate of change of S is gamma I and the rate of change of I is minus gamma I. That's one part of our model. The model is not done, but we have done one part of the model. And so we can um, leave that aside for a moment and, and try to think about what is the next, um, what is the next process. So the next process is of course going to be um, the one that is a little bit more complex but it's the uh, process of infection itself. So let's, let's try to um, realize what we've done wrong so far. We've assumed that there's an individual that is infectious and every so often is going to create new infectious individuals. And that's true, that's correct, but that's the very um, phenomenological reading of the situation because if we try to think about okay what's going on here that an infectious individual is going to create new infectious individuals and we, we start to realize that there's a number of decisions that we need to take here um, and they're not wrong or, or right even though there's um, a volume of literature on when each are justified but we're going to try and um, and simplify the issue as, as much as we can. So in order to create an individual that is infectious, you need to have uh, an individual that is susceptible first, right? Well, that, that's something that we can, we can think about in terms of, um, well, what is the probability that I'm going to find an individual that is susceptible? And that's when we turn that into um, a biostats 101 problem. We have an urn, and in this urn, our balls that are either infectious or susceptible. And what we're really interested in is what is the probability of having an individual that is susceptible. And because everyone um, that, that took a biostats class has been traumatized with this sort of problem, we know that it's equal to S over N. What is the proportion of this individual in the total population here? So we have, uh, here we have N equal seven probably, S equal four. And so if you pick something at random, if you pick one individual at random from this pool, the probability that it's going to be susceptible, it's going to be uh, four over seven, which, um, does not simplify. So we're going to create a new individual, 4 over 8. It's going to be 0.5. You have one out of two chances. You have half uh, a chance of getting an individual that is susceptible here. Of course, if this individual is susceptible um, and then it becomes infectious itself, it's going to change the population um, and, and so the probability for the, next, uh, for the next iteration. But for the moment, let's just um, keep it this way. So another way to think about this problem is to say, well, we have a series of individuals, right? Um, there's four of them here that are infectious and there are four of them that are not infectious. Um, but the, the process of contagion is, is something that we don't necessarily need to um, address at a scale that is that broad. So let, let's try and simplify this a little bit and say, well, there is a, um, 
there is one individual that is susceptible and four individuals that are infectious. Or let's do that in also a different way and say, well, there's one individual that is infectious and four individuals that are um, susceptible. And it, that's still too much complexity. I don't want to deal with that. I want to deal with something that is, is simple. And one thing that is simple is to say, well, ultimately, what we're repeating over and over and over again is this one event. There is one individual that is infectious and one individual that is susceptible. And, and we have this process that is iterated many, many times over, or many times a question that we're going to ask um, immediately after that. But the, the process of contagion here, getting from, you know, what is um, TI here, um, we can express it as being there's a box in which we put two individuals. One is susceptible, one is infectious. That is a highly unethical experiment to perform. Um, and how long do we need to take, how long do we need to wait for both individuals to become uh, infectious? That is TI. Um, that's essentially what that is. And we, we, we've simplified it, we've oversimplified it a little bit before, but that's what we're interested in. And so there is this process here uh, that we're going to iterate a number of times. So, how many times are we going to iterate this? And that's where people usually, and by people, I mean uh, people who do modeling of infectious disease usually start uh, having a polite disagreement about density, uh, density dependence versus frequency dependence. Um, but essentially, we have a duration for the moment and same rules apply as before, right? This duration is going to vary as a function of each. A uh, pair of individual in this system, it's going to have some stochasticity. Whatever, we're going to say that 1 over ti is equal to some quantity that we're going to call beta. And it's going to be a rate. And it's going to be the rate at which per contact or per encounter, you're going to uh, turn an infectious individual, sorry, susceptible individual in an infectious individual. So there's an important thing here um, that we can we can check. Um, at this time here, we have uh, small n equal to, and here we still have small n equal to. So whatever change we're going to apply to the number of individuals that are infectious or susceptible is not going to change the population size here. It's, it's not going to change um, capital N. It's going to change uh, capital S and capital I, but we know that whatever is going to be lost by one compartment is going to be transferred directly um, to the other. So what is the overall change? Well, the overall change is going to be um, every for every individual I that is infectious times some rate that we derive from the duration, the virus duration between uh, events of infection times something. And what we're going to say here is what is the probability that an individual that is infectious is going to pick, to bump at random into an individual that is susceptible. Uh, oh, and that's this little uh, drawing balls from an urn problem. So S over N. Let's reframe that a little bit. Uh, we're going to say that the rate of change is going to be beta times I times S over N. This one is uh, the frequency dependent version of the model. In some cases, you're going to find, uh, or you're going to want to write the same model as being uh, times S. So what matters is not necessarily the proportion of individuals that are susceptible, it's a number of uh, individuals that are susceptible, and that is going to be density dependent. Um, a really good intuition that I've, uh, I've seen for that is uh, density dependence makes sense if, for example, you need to go into a room that has um, three people and they're all infectious, 
or the room has 10 people and they're all infectious. And the rooms have the same surface, the same volume, exact same number of, um, sorry, exact same properties, except one has three infectious people, one has 10 infectious people, no one else, everyone in the room is infectious. Uh, pick a room. You're going to pick the room with, um, with three people because it has uh, the lowest risk here. Uh, and that, that would be a density dependent transmission. Frequency dependent is when you um, when you, you you're bumping into multiple people over uh, over time. There's something here. There's a, a hidden assumption that we're not making about the area that we're trying to model. So if we we scaling to something that is one um, one building versus a city versus country, um, we need to consider things a little bit differently. But for the moment, we um, are going to say, well, we're assuming the very small closed system where we draw individual that we bump into at random. And so we are going to use uh, this model. So um, let, let's make a little bit of um, check about the units here. So the units of these terms are going to be the units of beta times the units of i times the units of s divided by the units of n. Um, s and n are the same units. They're number of individuals. So that's going to simplify. Um, i, it's number of individuals. And beta, it's, well, good question. What is, what is beta expressed in? So what we know is that ultimately this is going to go into our model and we've expressed uh, both uh, i dot and s dot as having uh, units of individuals per days, per time, whatever. And, and so that gives us an ID uh, of what the units of beta can be. And so beta here is going to be expressed as days minus one. Well, that's where we come back to here and we check that it's making sense with the assumption that we've made and it's uh, beta is um, can be derived from a rate which is one over a duration. The duration is expressed in days um, and so we can uh, we can express this as uh, days minus one. Um, that is second step, the second process done here. Right, we, we, could, we could draw the same little thing that we've done before, but let's get back to this um, template that we've done. This is it's done. Uh, and we know that the, the change here is going to be beta times i times s over n. And uh, because it's an infection, it's going to lead to the infectious component gaining that. So it's going to be beta times i times s over n. And it's going to lead to the susceptible component losing individual and they're losing the same number of individual every time so we can you know we can uh, we can we can make the little check that it's also the sum of that is also equal to zero uh, and now what we need to do is put the two together so in order to put the two together uh, we're just going to uh, get here and rewrite the two model so s dot is equal to gamma i uh, minus, no, you know what, let's do that properly, s dot is equal to minus beta i times s over n plus gamma i, and i dot is going to be beta i times s over n minus gamma i. Cool. Um, that's a system. Let's write it here. Uh, and now what, we have, uh, what we've done here is that we've um, aligned the different terms that correspond to different mechanisms. So that's uh, infection here. And uh, let's call that, I don't know, recovery here. And, and we can check that the only thing that is 
Uh, the only thing that is changing really is, uh, it's okay, it's plus or minus here. So whatever is gained from one compartment through infection is lost from the other through the same mechanism. Whatever is gained through recovery is lost through the same um, process in the other compartment. And, and, and then again, if we do the sum of that, we're going to have gamma i minus gamma i plus beta i whatever minus beta i whatever. It's also going to be equal to zero. And so the rate of change of the entire population uh, s dot plus i dot is still going to be equal to zero. And so the usual um, results that we had previously are still true. At any time, there's going to be n individual in the population. No, um, it's done. We have a model, right? We, um, we came up with something that's called the SIS uh, for susceptible infectious susceptible model of um, disease transmission that, that work for things like the common cold, for example. Uh, but when we started playing around with the idea of expressing things as, uh, as time before, we had this intuition that that is maybe, maybe something worth exploring here, which is that if you uh, take the time during which you remain infectious and you divide by the time uh, it takes you to infect someone new, TR or TI, um, if, if that is larger than one or smaller than one, it should mean different things for the behavior of this um, model. So let, let's do a thing. Let's uh, do a thing that is, you know, good practice with whatever model you're working with and say, um, oh, I have, I have an I here, an I here, an I, an I here. So that may be something that we could, you know, factor. Um, so let's do this thing here, i dot is equal to i times beta times s over n minus gamma, right? It's this equation and this equation are the same. We've just, oops, sorry, uh, we've just changed the way the, um, the signs are organized. There are a couple different things we can do at this point. Uh, because we know that s plus i equal to n, we could say that s is s minus i, or we could say that i is n minus s. Um, and both of these um, reframing of terms are going to be useful at different, uh, to do different things, but right now we don't really need to do that. Right now there's a question that um, I'm interested in, that is, um, what is the sign of that? Because you know the sign of um, the, the sign of a differential equation is going to tell you if it's growing or decreasing. And I'm I'm interested at, in the sign at a very specific case, which is when there's barely any infectious individual in the population. What does it take for this um, for this um, for the infectious component to uh, grow in size? So that's where we can start making a little bit of um, assumptions here. Um, in order for this thing to grow when i is very small, we want this thing to be larger than one, essentially. So we're interested in beta s over n minus gamma as to be larger than one. If that is larger than one, then um, the change is going to be something that is, you know, a little bit larger than, a um, little bit larger than it was uh, before, and so it's going to turn into something that um, grows over time. So, um, sorry, I'm pretty sure I'm getting this one wrong. Um, no, it's a sorry, it's a it's a um, derivative of time, so it needs to be positive. So it's beta uh, over n minus gamma has to be positive, right? Um, same difference, essentially. Uh, and so let's do this. Beta times s over n has to be larger than gamma. So if this is true, right? So this is going to, um, the number of infectious individuals is going to increase. 
and when the number of infectious individuals increases, then the, uh, there's going to be an, an outbreak of this disease. So there's a simplification we can make here because we're interested in this when i of t is small. And if i is small, that means it's essentially equal to zero. And so s is essentially equal to n minus yeah, almost zero. Uh, and so it means that beta s divided by n is just about equal to beta, right? So what we can say is um, we can take this thing here and say there's going to be an increase if beta is larger than gamma. So beta is a rate um, that is a rate between two um, infectious events. So it's actually ti minus one because beta is one over ti and so ti is one over beta. Uh, and so uh, we want ti minus one. There's going to be a relationship between ti minus one and between uh, tr minus one because that is all we got. Um, because that is all we got the uh, value for beta and then um, gamma. And so uh, the relationship is going to be if ti minus one is lower than this, it's going to be uh, true. And so we're going to get rid of that. And what we want is ti. It's got to be lower than tr. So, oh. Sorry, let me put that here where everyone can see it. It's ti is lower than tr. And so we sort of got back to where we started, right? Where um, here is a result that we had. We said if, if ti is lower than tr, there's going to be multiple infection events before you recover. Um, and so the ratio of tr divided by ti is going to be larger than 1. And here, after we went through all of the steps of converting these ideas into equation and, 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 and solving everything and making um, all little assumptions, we end up with um, this disease is able to invade an almost entirely susceptible um, population if Ti is, slow, is smaller than uh, Tr. So we got back to our um, original intuition. And what, is, what, is, what I think is interesting here is that um, this result is something that we were able to um, establish or make, make a supposition about that without necessarily writing any mathematics. It's just based on having some intuitions about the way things were working and, and trying to understand what happens to what individual in a population. And we got to this very, uh, very important result here. Uh, and, and we go through the process of, of coming up with the actual model and writing the differential equation and all that and, and taking the units and, and, and making sure we've done the job properly and then we get back to this, um, to this result. Um, and when I say that it's very important, it's, it's because the, um, this ratio of TR over TI, it's going to be this thing that we call R note. Uh, it's it's the closest thing we have to a golden ratio when you're talking about uh, infectious disease modeling because it's the number, the predicted number of new cases established by a single uh, infectious individual. And when it's larger than one, then it's going to mean that you can anticipate an outbreak. If it's smaller than one, um, you um, the situation is under control and the disease is going to stop growing here. Uh, and it's something that you can reach through multiple paths from a mathematical point of view. There are dozens of ways to, to get to this constant. Some are very simple, some are very complex. Um, but it's also something that you can, you can sort of reason your way into uh, simply by saying, okay, take some time to recover, take some time to infect people. Uh, if it takes three times as long to recover than it takes to infect people, then I would probably uh, I can expect to infect three people before I recover. Uh, and so that's going to be the um, rate of growth of this um, 
specific outbreak. And so it's it's always interesting to work from uh, from from intuition and from abstraction when you're trying to build a model of something. This particular model happens to be very simple, but the process of, um, for example, adding demography to it is not necessarily a lot more complicated. The process of saying, well, instead of um, being susceptible immediately after um, you lose your infectious status and you, you have some immunity that develops, it's not necessarily more complicated. You simply need to create a new compartment and think about, oh, um, from a very phenomenological point of view, or are individuals moving across these different compartments, and then you uh, translate that into uh, mathematics. And that, that's much closer to the actual, um, that is the actual heavy lifting of, of building a model, right? It's taking the thing that you know and, and writing them in the language of um, mathematics. Of the implementation that comes after that is, uh, is, is a lot easier. And when you take the, the time to do this work uh, properly, you can, you can develop some intuitions that are going to help you make sense of the uh, simulation that you, uh, that you have. So that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, and coming up with this model is not necessarily, it's just like four pages. And you know, if you do it properly and you just condense everything, it's going to fit on a, like a post-it note. It's not a complex. Um, it's not necessarily a complex model to come up with, but it's um, it, it's good practice. Um, just trying to say, okay, I know the solution. What are the principles that I need to reach this solution for a model that you know or for a situation that you know really well is, is going to um, help you translate uh, biological ideas into abstractions and abstraction into um, equations that you can then uh, manipulate. So thanks everyone for your time uh, and uh, stay safe. Bye.